Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening from wherever you're logging into the conference. And welcome to Creating a Fundraising Mindset. I'm Suzanne McGarry with Pacific Youth Foundation, and I'm their resource development consultant, and I get to moderate today. I'm joined by Aaron Hogan, the executive director of Petros Zoe Uganda in Uganda, and Rosie Torres, who is the board president of the Boys and Girls Club of Rosarito in Mexico. Uh, we are going to, we have some conversation and uh, big ideas we're going to approach, and then we will take your questions at the end. So please use the Q&A uh, box to the right of your video player to put any questions as they come up as we uh, start this conversation. So ladies, I wanted to open today with the idea of a culture of philanthropy. And in my experience here in the greater Los Angeles area with nonprofits, uh, I found that organizations are very successful fundraisers when the fundraising is not just the function of one or two people like the executive director and if they have professional staff, but rather it's a commitment by the whole board and even staff to uh, their impact uh, of the community of whoever walks in that uh, this organization is run on the support of its community and financial investment. So Aaron, I wanted to ask you, um, you had shared with me earlier this maxim you use about we grow through dreaming and I found that very inspiring. Can you talk about the culture of philanthropy at your organization? Absolutely. So um, fundraising by itself is something that I realize is impossible when it comes to growth. And so early on in this uh, organization, I was like, I need to get the entire team involved. Now, first of all, I can't ask my staff to be over involved in getting the organization money if their own finances aren't developed. So we as an organization develop our staff's finances um, personally before we ask them to fundraise for us as an organization. So we have finance training every week, we check in with each other, we um, get some, some advice from our financial manager about how can we grow our own personal businesses. And that already creates a fundraising mindset, a financial mindset, a growth mindset. And then what we do is each month, we have an actual budget, and then we have a dream budget. The actual budget is based on where we are currently at, based on the finances that have been coming in every month, um, the operational money that we have available, and what's realistic that we can do with our money. And then we have a dream budget. Our dream budget is basically, if resources were not an issue, what would we do this month? And we take the, the actual budget, then we take the dream budget, and through that dreaming process is where the growth happens because it creates this challenge of, yes, I'm here, but how do I get there? How do I get to my dream? And then together, because there's a, a sense of excitement, because there's a sense of, I can do this, I can make the impossible possible, they start thinking of how to make money. They start thinking of how to increase finances. And so instead of just saying, this is what we have, and this is how it's going to be, it's this is what we have, but this is where we want to go. So how do we bridge the, the gap to get there? That's great. Thank you. Rosie, can you share what your board, your board's philosophy of uh, contribution and investment in the club? Yes, of course. Good morning, everyone. Well, basically, at the beginning, we started uh, when we saw the club in Tijuana, the first one that was brought in, we thought, well, everybody was going to be donating, right? This is a fabulous cause. This is what we need in Mexico to keep kids off the streets. Well, wake up, Rosie and everybody. This is not happening. Mexico, we don't have the culture of uh, volunteering, of donating. This is like just something that, uh, that we have. So what, what happened, we started to innovate. Uh, we started to gather, uh, thank goodness, Rosarito, we have so many Americans, retired Americans living here that they kind of know the culture about what's going on and not. So uh, amongst them, we created the board and a few Mexicans. And each of the board members is, uh, we, they don't donate to the club, but they do events, specific events for the club. So we had to innovate where everything from mariachi concerts to uh coffee breaks to restaurant uh different restaurants to donate among other things so uh that's what helped us over here that uh, it was the americans that helped us innovate but also 
another beautiful thing that I, I noticed amongst the 10 years that we have the club operating is that Mexico, as I mentioned, we don't have the volunteer culture. However, my kids at the club, when they saw the Americans going to volunteer and they started to grow, uh, grow out of the club's age, they want, I want to volunteer. So we created this new culture with the kids as they were seeing the Americans as they were inputting their culture. So this is fabulous. This worked for us. Yeah, that's great. I, um, in my experience, because before I came to Boys and Girls Clubs, I worked uh, in hospital fundraising, so much larger institutional nonprofits here uh, in the States. And uh, something that we helped get to for employee engagement was, well, one plus the employees were more established. So they were able to donate either some time or treasure of their own, very small ways, but that created such an impactful story to say that they are like, it's like they're all profit sharing in essence of the intangible profit of your mission. Exactly. Um, but we would train, like, cause very often we would take donors on tours of different facilities. And we, and we boys and girls clubs also do that or youth clubs, but how can you make ambassadors of your staff who are the most, the frontline experience of your mission in action for whatever uh, area they have so that they can speak towards the mission, not just, well, what do we do in this room or in this program, we do blank, but maybe uh, just through some training. So if you do tours once a month or once a week, they, they're already ready. They know that they're the ambassador and that they can bridge not just the activity, but to the outcome, to the mission. So mm -hmm. I really encourage you guys to consider that of who are your staff champions and how you can elevate them for tours or to speak to your board about the latest development and impact they're having. The other thing I wanted to share um, is the idea of a kind of like a contract for your board members when they come on board. So they understand the expectations and opportunities for, for them. And whether that lines out a, a, a term of, of commitment, how much, how many meetings to attend, uh, is there a financial expectation of whether or not they can contribute themselves or can uh, fundraise on your behalf through their community, uh, which many board members are excellent at doing. Even if they can't contribute themselves, they have a network of people and ideas and talents that they can draw resources to the club. So sometimes those are called a, a code of contact, code of conduct rather, or a board contract. And I'm happy I was gonna work with the World Federation of Youth Clubs to maybe create some templates. They're usually just a one page uh, item, but that the board member would sign at the beginning of their term. And it's something you can refer to, especially if with the board, maybe there's some confusion of expectation and they're not quite meeting that. So uh, great. I, We'll move on to my next big idea, our next big idea, if we can, which is about raising capital. So it's not just the day-to-day -day fundraising, but it's raising dollars for those big projects, a building um, or other major investment that's uh, fixed in time. It shouldn't be how you'll fundraise forever, but um, those big projects. So Aaron, I wanted to ask you what have been some, I know you're involved in a big capital project now, what are some key success factors that you have found in this process? So um, we're still early on in our project. We were able to acquire an acre of land, um, which is very close to where most of our operations are run. And so, but what, what the very first thing we did as an organization, knowing that we didn't have the experience for such a big project, is we found a mentor. Before we even began the drawings, we found a mentor organization that can walk us through something that they've already done. And our mentor organization, it's called Worship Harvest. They're undergoing four building projects right now, one being a very, very large one. And uh, most of the, a lot of people who work within that organization are engineers, architects, they're a wealth of knowledge. And so, They've gone before us, they've made mistakes, they've lost a lot of money in those mistakes, and now they're giving us the advice before we have to go through those mistakes. So one of my biggest pieces of advice, really for any aspect of, of an organization, is find someone who has been there before. And then in addition to that, a big mistake I've seen a lot of organizations that I've been involved with make with building projects 
is they wait until they get almost all of their money to make progress. And so what happens is donors give, they give, they give, and then they don't see any uh, results of their giving. And so what we decided to do was break our project up into segments, into blocks, if you will, and then break down the cost within those blocks. So maybe a slab of concrete costs this much money. You fundraise for that much money and you do the, you, you do the work. And it increases the donor's confidence in the project, knowing that, okay, I gave and within a small amount of time, the money has, has done work, the money has done good. And so those are the two things we're looking at. And again, I, we're, we're early in the project. So even if I come back next year and talk to you guys about this, I'll probably say, okay, so now with the wisdom we've gained, this is what we're now focused on. But to start this project off well, those are the two main things that we're looking at for this project. And how are you demonstrating um, your progress right now? I mean, is it by bringing the investors, are they part of it? Or is it something you broadcast or through social media? So um, we're very active on our social media, um, which I know we're going to talk about a bit later. And that's been so, so key because that's how most people even know the project is going on. Um, but then there has been a few people who have invested more specifically in buying the land that we acquired. And uh, for those specific people, we've been having Zoom meetings. We've been keeping them very updated by email. And we want them to be included in every step of the, prog uh, of the, the process. And so mostly it's just being in their faces about here's what we're doing here's the plan here's what's going on and that's been helping a lot great thank you rosie my question for you around this is i know you share with me uh, that your organization has an angel investor which is a, a contributor that makes a, a major gift year over year and yes. i wanted to ask you about um that process of stewarding that uh support and uh, also how you mitigate um, putting all your eggs necessarily in one basket. So the, the second half, and I'll prompt you if we don't get there, is like, how do you uh, prepare yeah. to diversify? Okay, no, I understand. At the beginning, as I mentioned, we had nothing, nobody, no, nobody knew the concept here in, in, in Rosarito Beach. So this uh, uh, again an american guy who is our vice president actually gills perry he came to me he said well let's create this event because i know there's an uh, uh this millionaire who just moved into rosarito and i believe he likes this type of music so we started creating the mariachi festival and we got the attention of this guy who immediately fell in love with our concerts and knows the concept of the boys and girls club so we started to see what he liked or what he liked the most and how we could keep him on. He loved us. We were so, so uh, lucky that he loved everything. And he started to help us on the board. And he said, well, let's work out with every specific person on the board. What do you like to do? What do you know? Who do you know around you in your circle, in your, in your uh, businesses? entrepreneurs, uh, enterprises, anything. Let's work a specific to each person. So even though we have this angel, as you say, Suzanne, yes, we do have this wonderful man. Uh, he, taught, he taught us how to get a hold of individuals in our board to get their own individuals, their own circles. So that's how we managed to raise our different little funds eventually, one by one, the event by event, uh, either uh, you know, silent auctions, concerts, uh, raffles, whatever. But they, everybody in the board had to innovate also yes. amongst their circle of friends. So this guy, not just the angel in donating, but the angel in experience. Yes. I like that, just the thinking of um, so often board members that we, we diminish or uh, fundraisers diminish the product. Like we don't want to brag about it or sell it instead of uh, really embracing, just sharing your pure love for the organization and why you dedicate your time, um, either as a professional or as a volunteer or donor. And that story alone is contagious. So I think that's brilliant how your board member saw that this person had the potential yes. to really make a huge difference. And all you had to do was present the mission. And it turns out they were already inspired and familiar with it. 
Uh, yeah. And then they just his own thinking was like, well, here, here's some other people to meet and talk to. So it's always thinking of renewing that. And it's as simple as just sharing your personal story. I think of why you give and do what you do. You don't mm -hmm. have to convince anybody, you know, they'll hear it. Uh, and if it's a right fit for them, if it's in alignment with their um, life philosophy and goals, it's, it becomes much easier. Yes, the right yeah, thing. That was the fun yeah. part. Thank you, Susanna. Yeah. Um, now let's talk, we've kind of talked about this, about getting the word out. That kind of leads to our next conversation about strategic communications. So as a fundraiser, I see all marketing as fundraising. <laughs> Because so and that's just my philosophy. It's like how a hammer see is a nail. Like that's, just, that's what you do. So I believe that all communication should have a call to action um, to support the organization. And it doesn't have to be, and I, I want to be sensitive internationally that there are different cultures of what is offensive, or you're asking me for money, or I'm gonna, it's gonna make me withdraw. <laughs> but how to um, invite them just to support and engage. Uh, and whatever way culturally you think is appropriate, but always a call to action. You don't want to waste an opportunity um, to have someone's attention and remind them that you're not government supported or cor fully corporate supported, that you got to tell the story. This is how we run. Uh, and this is the impact we're making. And we want to you know, invite you to help make an impact. So, uh, but the marketing is very expensive. Uh, even in places with, you know, in the U.S. with so many resources here, it's still prohibitive uh, to buy ad time or uh, stories or have a dedicated staff person to do this. So how on how can we do this with uh, simple resources or what or very little? So I wanted to uh, talk about how you guys are telling your story um, and what the resources you're using. Uh, to get that community support and new donors, let alone um, new ambassadors for your organization. Erin, do you want to share what you're doing with social media right now? Or Sure, yeah. Um, so <laughs> I, I don't understand how organizations survive these days when they're not on social media. Um, because even for us as Petra Zoe, when there are organizations that want to come on and, and maybe partner with us or or, you know, like resource their people to us or whatever, the first thing I do is look at their social media. And if I go on their social media and the last post was in 2016, I'm like, ah. And so even if they are doing good work all the way through to 2021, but they don't have any posts for five years, I lose uh, trust in the organization. And um, I might be alone in thinking that, I don't think I am. Um, but it's just these days, you have to be on social media. There's no more using excuses of, ah, I don't know about Facebook, I don't know about Twitter, I don't know about Instagram. Being in, on social media and active on social media is a must. And there are so many free features of social media that you can access um, as an organization with, without ever paying for a sponsored ad. Um, and so that's the main source that we use right now. So we're on YouTube, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, um, and we update all of those platforms almost on a daily basis. Uh, and it's the constant being in people's face that attracts us to more people. We've got new donors just from people landing on our Facebook page. We've got new volunteers, people looking at our website site and Facebook pages. Um, we've been connected to different foundations that offer grants just because of our social media. And um, so I, I would just encourage people, if you're not good at it, get good at it. Talk to someone, Google how to do these things. Um, because there's something about social media these days that it builds people's trust in your organization. And you don't have to have a marketing team to run a Facebook page, really. It's, it's easy. Now, do you do the posts yourselves or is staff taking pictures and captioning or what's going on? So uh, for now, uh, there's probably three people in the organization, myself included, that have access to the social media page. Um, mostly what happens is my staff send me content, whether it's pictures, stories, um, advertisements, flyers, they'll send me content. And then we, as the leadership team, filter what goes on our social media. Just as it's important as 
<laughs> posting a lot, it's also important posting quality. Everything you put out there represents your name as an organization. And so we are slowly building a team that we can trust with our social media. But um, as per right now, it still goes through my co-director and I uh, before it goes live on the, on the page. And how are you getting uh, followers? Like, do you have, I know in the US there's new laws where you have to get someone's email address. Like if you're doing a newsletter or something else, they have to opt in um, rather than be like, you just take their email from some, you know, you have to have express permission. How are you gathering those followers? Yeah, so um, it's different depending on which country because I'm, I'm, I'm from the United States, so I have a big following, um, Perpetua Zoe, in the U.S., but my co-director is Ugandan, so she has a big following here in Uganda. And um, I would say the biggest success we have is through speaking engagements. So people get to know and trust us in person as we're speaking to either a group of people, a school, a club, and then we get their permission right there. Hey, we have a newsletter. Can we, can we get your email to sign up for the newsletter? Then in our newsletters, we have a link to our Facebook page. They find us on Facebook. So we take advantage of those in-person interactions because there are so many Facebook pages out there and you never know who's genuine and who's not. And so those in-person meetings really build the trust. And then we take the opportunity to get that information and get their permission on the spot. Even as far as you're standing next to somebody and you're talking to them, you say, oh, we're actually on Facebook. Instead of waiting for them to go home and find you, just pull up your Facebook page right there on their phone and then they can decide whether or not they press the like button. Great, you're on it. <laughs> Yeah. Rosie, I wanted to ask you, I know you're doing something really innovative with your uh, both capital project and uh, social media. Do you want to, can you share with everyone? Yes, of course. Well, uh, Facebook, as Erin was saying, this is fabulous what, what Erin was saying. Facebook, as you know, has now a, a live option that you can do a live video. Uh, here uh, in, in Mexico, it's very hard. Uh, we try to go to the schools at the beginning, no? And, and present it to every class and all most of our kids that we could fathom to, uh, to present it to. However, the politics in the school boards is like, okay, that's enough. You can't do it anymore. You can't present in the schools. So that was kind of hard for us. However, as I mentioned, Facebook started just, um, I don't know, two years ago, this new live button, no? And I do the live interviews on the club or anywhere else, you know, as Erin says, anywhere you can. Uh, and I interact with everybody who starts getting online with me. And sometimes I bring them on camera on live. So Facebook is fabulous, as Erin as says, social media, you, you can't live without it. This live, uh, as I'm into, um, socializing with everybody online, they say, well, how can I donate and where do I donate? And then I have somebody who saw me and comes to donate. Then I interview this person again and they see this person that's donating physically at the club. So then everybody else more one at a time raises their hand. I want to help. How do I help? Uh, alongside with this, um, of course, uh, YouTube also, I'm not too good with YouTube, but Facebook helps me a whole lot here in, in my community, in my area. Along with that, uh, we have a fabulous webmaster who's a volunteer who created our webpage uh, and it came up with the fabulous idea because uh, as we have a lot of people here, Rosaitos, 100,000 people, they don't have a big budget, no? We're not a very rich town, but she came with the idea that we can donate five dollars a month so in our club page and in my live interviews if you don't if you can't donate a material or a hundred dollars set up a five dollar paypal monthly recurrence you set it up once and it'll recur again and again and for the person donating five dollars that's the cost of what we charge a, a, a child per month which is nothing right but if we have these one started drop by drop by drop by drop by drop. So $5 came up to a good amount for us. And it's something so basic and so that people say, okay, $5 doesn't hurt so much. Yes. Oh, I love that. I love one that, well, recurring gifts, annual giving is the lifeblood of diversifying income. We talked about it's unrestricted, it's regular 
because almost all organizations are going to fa face in their fiscal year highs and lows of expenses and incomes. And there's always those drought seasons where you have a lot of expenses, but nothing's coming in for a while. But it's community support like that annual giving that's going to ride you through. And then plus, it's so diverse. And um, in my experience, those annual donors, the people, as your organization grows in age, um, and develops and you realize, oh, this person has supported us for five years or 10 years. That's the type of person, even without a large gift, that might um, donate their uh, part of their estate to you. They, they deeply care about you and that can be really impactful. You don't have to be a high net worth individual to remember an organization in your plans. Um, even, I mean, obviously you support your family, but you know, even there are things called like remainder trusts or a portion of, or a, donate a car or whatever asset you have. Um, those are, that's where you should look of, uh, cause they're already so committed to your organization. And I also love that it's the increment is so tied to mission. It's, it, it's very inspiring. It's very easy to understand. I'm like, oh, this, a kid that couldn't go here otherwise. But for me, every month I'm getting a new kid uh, a year at the organization and or a month or whatever it is. And like that, a sponsorship, I'm underwriting. That mm -hmm. is very rewarding. And then I'm sure you're communicating to those donors, you know, through newsletters and they're seeing it, see the faces if, you know, as appropriate. Mm -hmm. So that's great. I wanted to ask now how we leverage since it's an international conference and obviously we're World Federation uh, admin is here in the States. Um, and I think of Boys and Girls Club of America and things. How are you guys inspiring international investment? How is your social media reach um, going out there? So maybe you could get some investment from more established uh, donors, uh, either in the US or uh, other countries for you. So uh, I can go first quickly. Um, so personally for Petro Zoe, we have a vocational school that produces products. And um, a lot of times, those products, well, every time, because we're in Uganda, they, they have a Ugandan flair, they have African fabric. Um, and those things also happen to be very trendy overseas, which is great for me <laughs> uh, and for our organization. So whenever I travel, there's both the option to buy those products that also have our logo on it. So we're getting the word out through that. And then we put information in the products before they even know they're getting information, whether it's flyers, brochures, cards. So then they go with some marketing, um, uh, marketing material. Um, and then we've also started an ambassador program. Now our ambassador program, it was actually inspired during COVID because I couldn't travel to the United States like I usually did. Um, I would go usually in June and December, but when all of the borders were closed, I didn't have an option. I couldn't leave Uganda. And those fundraising trips helped us so much. Cause like I said, you build more trust in person. So then I was like, wait a minute, there are so many people in the States that already have a lot of faith and love for Petro Zoe and what we're doing. So why can't I call them ambassadors, give them certain responsibilities and roles and have them represent Petro Zoe in their home countries. So now we've started this program. We're working on getting products to them that they can also host parties and sell. We're getting uh, marketing material, um, printing flyers in each of the countries, making videos, um, and giving them the opportunity to spread the word. So now it's not only me that's spreading the word, it's 20 people, 30 people, however big it grows. So that's something that we're doing recently to spread the word. Great. Rosie, how, what, what are your board doing? Well, I, I believe it's something similar to Aaron's because as I mentioned, when I do a live video, not only do people help me with uh, bringing a stock or donating uh, uh, economically, but also there's, a, there's some key people online that know the club, know me, know what we're doing. And they say, well, let me help you. So they help me not just by sharing the video on Facebook and on their, their own media, but also communicating with different uh, enterprises. Uh, uh, mostly, Thank goodness, the 20,000 Americans that live in Rosarito, I always say thank you for them living here, retired Americans that live here, they have their group of people and they know about the club, they know about volunteering, they know what we're doing, so they grab all what we promote and they take it to their family, their friends in the U.S. Basically, it's just U.S. and Mexico, where you know California right across the border is one of the most economically 
gifted uh, sections of the world. So that's my main market. With my 20,000 retired Americans that know and help, not economically because some, most of them cannot, but they promote and get their family and their friends and whatever their ex businesses over there to help us come down here. So, and also when we have success stories, oh, I love success stories. My kids, when they start presenting, like my violinist who's now in the internet, in the Baja California Junior, uh, uh, how do you say it? The symphony? The, the symphony. harmonic orchestra? Yeah. Yes, she's with the violin. So we got her a whole bunch of uh, scholarships and every time we got a scholarship, we promote, we promote, we promote. So people started donating more musical instruments or getting more stuff regarding uh, this lady, this girl. Well, not just one, we have now like 10 different uh, kids who are presenting. So there's specific instrument to go present or, or everything, which helps us in the end promote that. So success stories are, are my dream. They're fabulous things that That's happen. Wonderful. I'm just noticing the time and I think it's time for us to uh, move on to questions and answers. So again, please use the Q&A box. That's just to the right of your video player. We're monitoring and we will do our best to get to all your questions. Thank you, Aaron and Rosie. Thank you, Suzanne. Awesome. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Hi, everyone. I'm Don Nagy from the World Federation of Youth Clubs team. And I'm so excited. Thank you all, ladies. This has been a great discussion. I've popped in here help with the audience questions. Um, so thank you again. This has been great so far. I wanted to go ahead, Suzanne, um, and start with one of the questions. Are we good with that, ladies? Okay, the first one we have is, how do organizations start to approach corporate organizations for funding and support? That's by Martin Soldier. Thanks, Don. Aaron, Rosie, I just had a thought before of always uh, engage your board, never go to a community fundraising uh, meeting without a board member. It's a chance for them to uh, tell the story, it, use their network. It also is a peer-to-peer -to, -peer to have a volunteer donor asking versus someone who's a professional staff. It just uh, deepens the impact. Uh, and also there's your board's corporate relationships. So it's a great place to start is who are within their own company, a board's company themselves, or uh, someone they're very friendly with or know personally. Uh, Aaron, Rosie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, Suzanne, that's an awesome point. Um, I was actually going to say something similar. And then in addition to that, it really, really helps to um, make it, make what the work you're doing, the community transformation work with the youth that you're doing relevant to who you're talking to. So for example, um, in Kampala here in Uganda, there are a lot of street children that are roaming the streets, they're begging for money, uh, and they're doing it in front of a lot of corporate buildings. And so a way that we could approach those corporate offices is, is by saying, hey, something we do as an organization is we skill youth, we teach them how to make money, we occupy their time, to get them out of these situations. And then all of a sudden, that corporation is now thinking, oh, this organization is helping youth, yes, but they're also dealing with something that is bothering us as a corporation. So sometimes big corporations seem very removed from what you are doing as an organization, but you can always find a way to tie it into something they might be interested in. There's actually a lot of questions popping up. This one's pretty much related to it. Can you talk about the importance of peer-to-peer -peer asking, right? So engaging board members, but that idea of peer-to-peer. -peer. Sure, and you know, by peer-to-peer, -peer, we mean uh, your board members, friends, family, relations, staff, friends and family. Um, I think a really good way to do this is around an annual campaign, or is just a, uh, things you do regularly, monthly, uh, about projects. So you have a flow of income coming, unrestricted income. And uh, this is done a lot in the US with someone doing a personal, like I'm gonna run a marathon for this cause. And I'm gonna put on Facebook that my, I have a fundraising goal, $5,000. And I'm going to ask all my friends that instead of a present this year, or instead of this, can you consider supporting this organization? And then plus it spreads the message of what you're doing. Rosie, what's your experience with peer-to-peer? Uh, -peer yeah, pretty much, uh, pretty much um, center in the community specifically. Even the community like ours is really small. 
you want to center the attention to the community because you want to start getting them involved somehow. When you get them involved, you might find out that this one person in every thousand or 5,000 people, he might or she might uh, be able to round up a GoFundMe page or something with their, with their own people. We also here in particular started a fabulous program because we, even though our community is, is, not, too, is not too wealthy, uh, it's called the program, Give Me Five. And in the community, uh, you give me $5 to our club page, $5 a month, and you forget about it. It's a recurring charge. Those who can do it, 25, 50, a little bit more. So you kind of have to grab the, the attention of the community to let them know what you're doing or what you're going to be doing or what you want to do, because very big differences, and have them get involved somehow. You never know who has this facility who, to help you out even more. And of course, get a main sponsor, always try to get a big company uh, if there is one, because it's kind of hard to find them sometimes, but uh, they know and you have to have them fall in love with you. I have another, I mean, there, there's lots of questions coming in, ladies. So there's apparently a very important topic for everyone today. Um, there's a question from Tim that says, I read once that donors have to see an organization's name about eight times before making an initial donation. Um, there's therefore a cumulative effect of the program's communication efforts. And so I think he was just hoping you could talk about that in your communication efforts. I know, well, Suzanne, you said all, you know, all communication is fundraising communication. Yeah, I always like to reference the movie. It's an American movie, but Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and it's always be closing, ABC. And it's like, I'm always, I'm fundraising. So always talking about the brand, always making sure that there's some call to action live button hyperlink on, on your email signatures, on, you know, you have your logo and everything you can do. And same with your board members, have them, if you have lapel pins, ways to identify your organization and brand uh, for that very purpose. Because I think it's very true, especially if you're a new organization or concept to a community, they need to be familiar with who you are, what you do, and, and that you're trustworthy. Erin, did you look like you had some thoughts too on this? Yeah, well, it just goes back to what we were saying about um, the need to be relevant on social media. Um, we have been given in this age such a great opportunity to put our name out there at very low cost or no cost. Um, before it was mailing campaigns, it was going door to door, there was a lot of physical contact and there was a lot of time that had to lapse before those eight encounters with your name could get across. But now we are in an age of social media where you can post every day and they see your name seven times in one week. Um, so I think it's, it's just about utilizing the resources and you don't have to have a huge marketing budget as an organization to create a Facebook page. There's actually a related question on that, Erin. So I don't know, just as you're talking about social media there, um, there's a question from Pablo and Monterey asking about um, how you said you don't need a marketing team to run uh, social media, but he wants to know how to organize to decide which content should be on social media so that it's actually aligned with the strategy. Yeah, uh, I can speak for, for what we do at PetroZoe. Um, we have a team, it's a small team, and it's a team of volunteers, but it's a team nonetheless, who um, basically screen each post um, before we send it out. That way there's not just one person just putting out in the universe what we want to say. Um, so that kind of controls content. And then um, we create social media calendars and plan posts throughout each month. That way we try to cover all of our bases as an organization and also be going in a certain direction instead of randomly posting. So I think just having those meetings, sitting down and saying, what are we posting in the month of March? Have that content ready, have the captions ready. That way you can be rolling them out. Again, another social media related question here. Um, do you pay for Facebook or Instagram advertising or are your followers coming to you through word of mouth or from personal recommendations. Does anybody pay for social media advertising? Well, sometimes yes, when you really need to get a message out there, when you have a special event or something going on, you have to measure and you get the, uh, like Facebook is fabulous, no? So you kind of know, strategize and depend and kind of learn on your way up how and how much 
and where to, to publicize. Also something that's worked for us here since we're an old school uh, small town, I got a hold of the local newspaper and they are pretty good about uh, sponsoring us when we have events or anything in particular. Like Garen says, at least once a month, maybe every two, three months, we post something on the local newspaper so that the community can get to know us again on a different note. Sometimes our community doesn't have internet. So we, of course, social media is key as Aaron says. So number one, nothing about it. I do uh, Facebook Live. On Facebook Lives, you don't, need to, uh, you don't need to pay on it. So it's fabulous and the community will help you share it once they get to know you. So the beginning is, uh, yes, you do have to go knock on the community's doors. And, uh, but also the old school way, it, it works in small communities that don't have internet. We have, I think, about five minutes left and probably at least five more questions. So we'll just try to go kind of as fast as we can. Um, Glenn had wanted to know, what's the biggest obstacle in fundraising that you feel that you've overcome? Wow. <laughs> That's a hard um, question because I'm sure there's lots of obstacles, right? Yes. I, I will say for, for me, um, because I'm, I'm the director of my organization. Uh, and so a lot of what I do is thinking about how to sustain the organization. An obstacle I had to overcome was getting used to hearing the answer no. Uh, it, it can be um, a bit disheartening hearing no, 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 no. Um, so it takes a certain, uh, a certain mindset like this session is all about a fundraising mindset to get back up and keep going and keep asking, keep asking, keep asking, keep trying fundraisers. So for me, it's uh, the positive mentality, getting used to saying no, hearing no. Yeah. Over here in Rosarito, I would have to say that the government is our worst uh, enemy here in all aspects. What about, um, I have another question about Thoughts on pipelines. So this is um, from Mike in South um, Africa talking about, can you share your thoughts on pipeline, pipeline development and prospecting, how to select and qualify possible donors and cultivate them to giving? And then also, what do you think a good win rate is for something like that? Like what, what is a good success rate for that? I can speak to that just to tee it up. Um... But uh, so pipelines, your, uh, your annual donors, your recurring donors, that is the greatest source of pipeline, obviously, just literally, because they're renewing a gift every month or week, whatever your terms are. But that's who to look with of who has given year over year, who has maybe increased their giving year over year. You could look at their largest one-time gift and also duration, how long they've been supporting and that might help you segment, it's called segmenting donors, of how to uh, strategically, like these, now they're ready for a tour. I think they needed a special experience. I think they just need to get closer to the mission because they have capacity to make a larger gift or support or maybe a capital project and are just looking for that invitation. They already have that loyalty there. Um, so that's where I would first look. So that's why those annual programs, like Rosie was saying, that the give me five, the uh, auto renew type of giving are, is so important because donor acquisition, that's like the energy, you know, the term for spending money, maybe to get a list of people in your community to solicit. Uh, that is a, sometimes operates at a loss, let alone break even for dollars in. So that's really for more mature organizations that are ready to make that type of investment. Um, and I don't think many need to do that right away. Rosie or Aaron? Well, they all start with the knock on the door of everybody. So it's a lot of work at the beginning. But once you started going and get those key members of the community or the businesses, make them fall in love with your project and just keep at it and thank you, thank you letters either every month or every other week or depending on the person that requires more attention or less attention. So you really have to kind of strategize there individually. Wonderful. Well, we have, I mean, we have time for maybe just one more minute of questions. There's multiple questions here. And so please know everyone that we will certainly have more information and sessions talking about fundraising going forward. 
but just kind of a quick question on um, donor recognition. Can you talk about kind of the importance of that um, at, for both large and small donors? Anybody want to take a stab at that real quick? I can I can briefly talk about it. Um, so what we, we we do both donor recognition publicly and then privately. Um, and I want to speak on privately. So our organization, we make different products uh, here in Uganda, and then we are able to, to export them out of the country. And so a lot of times, um, especially for our reoccurring donors, we'll give them uh, annual gifts that our youth here make. Um, and so it's kind of uh, like close to home. Um, they receive something from a youth that they have supported the whole year, and we recognize it as an appreciation for them as a donor. So just those small things really help people feel like they matter. I agree. I think it's that the small things can really go a long way. Well, we are out of time. I'm sorry, there's so many more questions coming, um, but we will definitely have more. There's another session on fundraising tomorrow, and then we'll have some more, um, possibly some webinars and things like that coming forward. So thank you all so much for this discussion. This has been great. Um, Suzanne, Rosie, Aaron, this was awesome. And so I just wanna encourage everyone to be sure to fill out the session evaluation. So scroll down and fill that out and then be sure you click to get to the next session to hear our awesome DJ and go from there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Lorraine Orr with Boys and Girls Clubs of America. I'm currently the Chief Operations Officer. And I just wanted to take a moment to say congratulations to the World Federation of Youth Clubs for your uh, hosting this international conference. As you know, Boys and Girls Clubs ha are, have been a, a collaborator for good with the World Federation since its inception. And we are so excited about continuing this partnership. Uh, we have, over the, the years, we have uh, obviously shared learning opportunities. We have shared resources uh, and, and we will continue to provide all of those services to, to you as you continue to, to work together as the World Federation. I can think of no greater time in, in, our, in our, our history as a, a world that we should not be doing more for, for young people everywhere. So again, congratulations on this event uh, and we hope to connect with you soon.